Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's, time to, it's time to start. It's my great pleasure to start our seminar and our uh, speaker for today, Professor Massimo Lanza de Christopheris. And the title of the talk would be Nonlinear Composition Operators in Generalized Morris Spaces. So please, Professor Massimo Lanza de Christopheris, go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the presentation, Professor Karapetians. And uh, today um, we are going to present a joint work with Professor Alexei Karapetians. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk, to talk here today. And uh, we consider a function f from r to r. And uh, an open subset omega subset of our n, open. And then we define the following operator, let's say, then we have to specify the spaces, of course, tf of the map g is equal to f composed with the g for all maps g from omega to R. Okay, if you have a map from this subset to the real, then you compose it with F. You have a map, of course, FOG is going to be also from omega to R. Okay, and we ask what are the questions? We ask for which Fs, for which f's tf which maps a map g to the composition fog maps a more a generalized more space a generalized more space to itself and for which f's tf is continuous, uniformly continuous, alpha helder continuous, Lipschitz continuous, always in a generalized more space. Okay. This operator, of course, is not a new at all, this nonlinear operator. And for extensive references on nonlinear composition operators, we refer to the map to the to the monographs of Pell and Zabraiko. Nineteen ninety, nonlinear superposition operators. To the monographs of Runst and Siegel, and to a more recent uh, monograph of Dudley and Norvaisha. Okay, today instead, we will not talk about the so-called Kaufman composition operator. Instead, we, will not, we are not going to talk to the also well-known composition operator, say CG, which takes a map F to FOG, and this would be linear in the map F. We are not going to talk about. Just I mentioned that there is an interesting paper by Hatano, Ikeda, Ishikawa, and Savano on this operator here in, uh, uh, of, uh, in a recent paper of 2021. Then, of course, we will see better the references. I show you the list. Okay, but we are not going to talk about it. First thing to do now, we have to introduce the generalized more spaces. And by the way, the definition is not uniform in the literature. Okay, P X R is going to be a ball in R N such that you know Y minus X, sorry, is less than R. It's a standard notation. Omega, we already said it is an open subset of R N. And then M omega is a set of measurable functions. All equivalence classes of measurable functions, if you wish. Functions 
from omega to r. And then we have a weight w. Okay, we have to be careful about the use of uh, word weight because the literature is, does not agree about, you know, there is not a uniform interpretation. For us, weight will be a map from zero plus infinity to zero plus infinity. So not a weight, let's say, in omega, but the weight on the real numbers, actually on the half line, okay? A weight function. And this is our weight. And P between one and plus infinity. And uh, if G, as we said before, it's a map from omega to R, then we introduce the modulus, if you wish, G, which depends on a positive number rho on the weight and uh, on the exponent P, which for us is between one and infinity, and on the set omega, which is defined as the supremum as X, R is in omega times zero rho of W R LP norm of G, where LP norm in the ball with center X and radius R intersection uh, with omega. Okay. And uh, what does generalized more space mean with exponent with weight W and exponent P? This is the space. M W P omega equal to the set of G measurable functions such that this modulus here of G that we introduced one second ago, which is on this line here, mean this one. When you set the row equal to plus infinity, so in other words, the radii here are free to go from zero to plus infinity, okay? This is uh, G plus infinity W P omega is less than infinity. And this is going to be the norm. This is going to be G um, M W P omega. So the set of functions G, which have this number finite, okay, it's the Morey space, generalized Morey space with weight. W and with exponent P, okay? This, this is well known to be a Banach space. Of course, if W is not trivial, so it's not identically equal to zero. Our Ws can be zero, by the way. And uh, let's make some examples of weights, classical examples of weights. Weights. Uh, let me plot them because maybe it's easier this way. So you take a lambda between zero and n over p. And uh, weight number one, which is one of the most important, is a power weight, which is r to the minus lambda. Here is r, of course. And then we have another weight here, which is also important in the applications, in which what you do is, maybe I can use another color, the color green for the graph. So I go down with R to the minus lambda up to here, to this point, and uh, this point is going to be the point uh, one. And of course, one could choose another number. And then the graph remains equal to zero, okay? And uh, we give a name to this second weight, which is W lambda comma one. And this number here, of course, is one, okay? So this weight is identically zero from one onward. And then let's choose another weight. So uh, maybe we can put it here. Third weight, so these are the classical weights, let's say. This goes down here with always R to the minus lambda here, R to the minus lambda. But then once you're here, you continue with one, okay? So this is going to be one. So this weight is, it has the nice property that its infimum is greater than one. Actually, um, it is one precisely, okay? So these are the classical examples of weights and uh, where the more the space uh, <laughs> theory is started. And uh, uh, M relative to the weight R to the minus lambda, which is the first in the left, PRN, 
is the classical homogeneous Amore space. Of exponents lambda and p. Okay? Instead, m relative to the weight to the second one, so relative to this weight here with this graph, r to the minus lambda and then goes down to one. W lambda comma one omega p. This is the classical inhomogeneous, sorry, uh, Moray space of exponents lambda and p. Okay, so. A couple of words about uh, the different definitions in the literature and also in the history about uh, the generalized ones. So uh, let me mention, of course, I'm, I'm sure I won't mention everybody, but in any case, Mizuhara is a paper in 1991. And uh, he considered a weight that uh, if translated into our, our notation now, it's a weight WR of the form phi R minus one over PR, where phi is from zero plus infinity to zero plus infinity. In particular, this phi here cannot be zero. As a matter of fact, it's in the denominator because you have here a minus. And uh, Nakai um, in 94, uh, this is a more complex definition in the sense that uh, WR, WR is replaced by a function of two variables, let's say phi in this case again, from our n times zero plus infinity to zero plus infinity. And again, that guy in 2000, I change the weight, so WR is equal to phi R minus one. The measure of the ball is zero one, again to the minus one over P. Again, for some phi with power positive values. And then <clears throat> Sawano, more recently, there is an interesting paper out 2019. It considers WR of the form phi R measure of the ball of uh, minus one over p okay and uh, no actually r so here and then also the kind of one yes yes sorry r uh why did i say this i said this because uh, for the results of today our results will be spelled out in terms of w if you want to say see them in terms of the weights of other authors you have a transformation you can do it okay but the defi today's definition, definition today is definition. Um, it's like the definition of Gagatishvili and Mustafayev. Um, 2011. And then also Burenkov. And see, for example, two interesting uh, survey papers in 2012 and 2013. And let me say also that most of these people dealt with the case omega equal to our n, but we are interested in omega domain. And as we shall see, the, the results take different forms if you have different sets, omega, okay? Now, let me also mention finally that Natasha Samko, 2008, maybe here was the first one, I considered a weights W not with the meaning that we have today, but a weight in the measure in omega. So dx times a W. So the significance of 
weight in the paper on Natasha Samko, it's a very different from the one that we have today here. Okay. And then the, you have the vanishing, vanishing, more generalized, more spaces. Okay. So we write MW0 P omega equal to the set of G's in the generalized moray, such that you remember that modulus with the, the introduced before, right? G of rho W P omega. If you take rho equal to plus infinity, you get the norm, right? And instead here, we want the, the limit as rho tends to zero, this stuff becomes zero. And uh, this is, of course, a subspace of WP omega, the generalized Morris space. And uh, if the condition is just that W is not identically zero, this is a closed subspace. Closed subspace. OK. And uh, <clears throat> what are our assumptions? Let me say a couple of words about the assumptions on the weight W now that we are going to deal with today. Our assumptions. On W. And let me say that uh, uh, I'm writing down a body of assumptions for which all the results today work. But uh, some of the results would work with only some of the the, of the, uh, the properties that I'm going to list now. However, I thought that for a presentation of 45 minutes, it would be able, it would be better not to focus the attention on these technical um, uh, conditions, but on the results themselves. So W, first of all, is uh, not identically equal. To zero, okay. Otherwise, it's not the more norm is not even a norm, and I want W decreasing. And uh, any course, it can be zero from a point onward, and uh, the limit as R tends to zero of W R R to the n over p W R multiplied by R to the n over p is zero, and I want that there exists. A rho zero, which can be a small number between zero and one, such that first of all, W R R N over P is continuous and increasing for rho, sorry, for sorry, R in zero rho zero. In the small interval, let's say. And the second property, which is some sort of a submultiplicative property, there exists a constant c greater than zero such that w of r, which can be written as, uh, as, as I said, just one moment, c w one over positive number alpha w of alpha r. There exists a, a, a C such that this inequality holds for what? For alpha, great, not only positive, but greater than one over the small number rho zero over. And the R has to be between zero and rho zero. And alpha R is less than rho zero. OK, so are these conditions natural? Well, what I can say first is that all the classical weights all the classical weights introduced before, introduced above, which are the exponents that more I started to use first, are okay, satisfy all above assumptions. which are the assumptions that uh, we use today. Also, let me say that uh, in the statements that uh, we try to um, 
write down the minimal assumptions. But there is an extra job one could do is uh, trying to find better conditions for which to minimize the number of conditions you have here on the board. With this respect, uh, uh, there are interesting remarks on the paper by Savano, not 2019, on the Indonesian Journal. OK, another remark that we are not going to deal with this issue today, however. Another remark, interesting remark, I think, is that if omega is bounded, then all the uh, more spaces with the classical weights are minus lambda and m w lambda comma one omega oh here's p and here's p of course and m w lambda p omega with the ways that you have seen before they all coincide coincide i mean they're the same set and the norms are equivalent okay and uh, so this is all for what concerns let's say the introduction of the morris spaces now we go to the analysis of tf which is the subject of today. And I want to point out one thing from the beginning, which is the following. The analysis of TF in TF of, of excuse me, TF in Lebesgue spaces is well known. And the threshold on the domain is that the domain omega has a finite measure of the domain omega has an infinite measure. So the threshold is M measure. This is the N dimensional Lebesgue measure is finite or the measure of omega is plus infinity. But instead, what do I mean for threshold? It will be clear, uh, it will be clear during the talk, but it means that uh, roughly speaking, the results in this case, the necessary and sufficient conditions in this case are different from the necessary and sufficient conditions in this case. Instead, for the more, the story is a little different. Instead, for generalized Moray, Moray, the threshold, if you will, the is that the function one belongs to the generalized moray. Having one in the moray, in a sense, is a condition on omega and on the w, of course, or that the function one does not belong to the moray, generalized moray. And for the vanishing, that one belongs to the vanishing moray, or one does not belong to the vanishing moray. So we shall see that the results in the case that one belongs to the moray or does not belong to the moray are different, okay? Problem number one for TF, the action problem. What does action problem mean? When is it true that TF of Moray or maybe vanishing Moray is contained in um, Moray? I repeat once more, if G is a function in, Mo in generalized Moray, then the composition with F is still in the same Moray. And uh, the theorem is the following, so theorem, if you wish. I do not repeat the assumptions on, on W. We already made them. Those will remain, okay? Okay, case one. If one is in the generalized Mori space, which is a condition, as I said, on W and on omega and P, then the following conditions are equivalent. TF maps Mori. I did the beta here. To 
tumor A. Condition number two, TF maps the vanishing Mari, which was a smaller space. Condition number three, TF maps the vanishing Mari to the vanishing Mari. Okay, so under this condition here, maybe we put an arrow because I want to use the one, two, three, are equivalent to the following condition. F is a subaffine, which means what? Means there exist A and B in the positive numbers, but also can be zero, such that Ft, f you remember, it's a function from R to itself. It's the outer function in the composition. It's less or equal than A T plus B for all possible T's in R. I say sub fine because I want to reserve the word sublinear to the case in which B is zero. Okay. So again. Necessary and sufficient condition in order that the TF maps a moray or a vanishing moray to a moray, it's that F is subaffine. Okay. And this is under the assumption that, under the assumption that, as we said, orange, one is in moray. And how about, how about instead the case in which one? is not in Mori. So if instead one does not belong to MW P omega, then what I want to say is that these are three conditions here. Maybe I use a blue one or a pink one, not to rewrite them, are equivalent To F is sublinear now, which means there exists an A in zero plus infinity such that FT is less or equal than A modulus of T for all T in R. What's the analogy with the Lebesgue spaces? Lebesgue spaces result would be like this one, but instead of having one in Mari, you would have finite measure. Instead of having one not in Mari, you would have infinite measure. Okay. And uh, for the sufficiency, which holds on the very weak assumptions for the sufficiency, let me also mention the paper with uh, Kidirmina. 2016, myself and Kirmina on Eurasian Mathematical, Eurasian Math Journal. Okay. The necessity instead, for the necessity, the proof of the necessity, the necessity is based on a generalization of a proof. of a proof of Gerard Boudot for LT spaces and not only. So Professor Gerard Boudot in Paris has been able to use this type of argument for several function spaces and uh, such a proof exploits a lemma of Katz-Nelson. Uh, lemma of Cass Nelson says it's kind of interesting, actually. I learned it from Bourdeau, this lemma, is that if you have an open set omega here, and uh, if you know that the, the, the map at TF maps the function space to the other function space, in this case, generalized Mari space, then you, there exists uh, a ball or a cube containing a cube, let's make a ball or a cube, if you wish, somewhere in the set, 
such that if the supports are all contained here in, 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 in the fact that they're small enough, then their compositions with F remains bounded in, in norms. So if all the norms or the functions, uh, if we take a, a set of functions whose norm is uh, small enough, then you're sure that the corresponding, let's say, images with the composition operators uh, remain bounded. And this is a statement of boundedness if the action is true, which means once the TF maps automatically uh, this um, local um, more the boundedness condition is satisfied. Okay, so it is based on this. Now, problem number two. So problem of action is roughly speaking solved, as we said, for the generalized more, as we, as we solved it one moment ago, at least we showed the, the result. The problem of uniform continuity. So let me say again, when is it true that TF is, UC means uniformly continues. Okay, let me shorten it this way, abbreviate it this way in generalized Moray. The question is that. Answer. Uh, as usual, we first consider the case that one belongs to MWP omega. Okay, in this case here, I can, we can say that TF from WP omega to MWP omega from Mori to Mori, generalized Mori, of course, is UC uniformly continuous if and not if from only the vanishing p omega to the whole more is you see if and not if from the small more vanishing more to vanishing more is you see and this condition is equivalent to F from R to R is uniformly continuous. So at least in the case in which one is more, there's no real surprise in the sense that, I mean, it's not a trivial to prove it, but I'm saying that TF is uniformly continuous if and only if F is uniformly continuous. But what is interesting is really the case in which one is not in uh, one is not in the, the more. If instead you have one is not in the more, then here is a little bit more interesting, I think. And we can prove that if one is not in the more, and if TF from M, even only from the vanishing more to the whole more, I'm sorry, to the whole more, is you see, uniformly continues, then F is Lipschitz, and F0 is zero. But what's the implication of this? You see, on the other hand, if F is Lipschitz and F0 is zero, then you can prove TF is Lipschitz. So what is the message of this statement? The message of this statement is that in the green case in which one is not more, the only, let's say, uniformly continuous composition operators that exist, generated by F, of course, are the ones for which F is Lipschitz, and therefore only the Lipschitz continues, no other. This is in sharp contrast to the orange case in which one is more, in which the uniform continuity of TF is equivalent to the uniform uh, continuity of F. Okay, so this is all for the uniform continuity. 
And now we go to the problem of alpha Helder continuity. So the problem of alpha Helder continuity. Okay, here let me uh, form alpha in zero one. I do not want to touch now the Lipschitz one because we it deserves a se separate treatment. And uh, here the point is that if TF maps the vanishing moray to moray and uh, is alpha Helder continues, Here I mean alpha Helder between the two Banach spaces. Then you can prove the following. The Helder constant of F, defined as classically, it's estimated by the chi E of Moray P omega to the alpha minus one times TF of alpha. TF of alpha is, T, I'm sorry, modulus of TF Alpha means the alpha Helder constant of the nonlinear operator of the F. So you can estimate in this way for which E, what does E, what does E mean here? For all possible subsets E measurable, of course, of omega with the measure of E between zero and plus infinity, but not at the end point. And uh, in particular, immediately, this in, generates a non-zero number, of course, if it is not empty or is not, it, um, has not measured zero, but never measures zero here, okay? So in particular, as a consequence, F is alpha Helder continues. And if F is not constant, which means that F alpha is not going to be zero, then you can multiply both end sides by the reciprocal of this number. And you deduce immediately by taking the supremum on the E's. Well, there is a small computation behind, but in any case, that F alpha M W P omega, it's less or equal than TF. Alpha. So you have a formula relating the Helder constant of F with that of TF. Okay. So this fact here plays a role because then we can prove the following theorem. If sorry, let me erase this. If F is Borel measurable. and not constant, then you have the following equivalence. Tf from mwp omega, mwp omega is alpha Helder continuous. And Tf from mw zero p omega M W, sorry, is alpha Helder continues, and T F from the vanishing to the vanishing is alpha Helder continues. These are all equivalent to this condition here, that F from R to R, as we know, for the whole talk, is, and now the condition for this case is alpha Helder continues, and one belongs to the Mari. Because you remember, this comes from the fact that you, you have um, uniformly Helder continuous operators only with the Lipschitz ones, okay? And 
if the above conditions hold, and if one of the above hold equivalent conditions, so these are equivalent, I'm sorry, are equivalent. If so, then you have the reverse inequality that TF alpha. So the Heller constant of the operator TF, nonlinear operator TF is less or equal than the Heller constant of F times one, one minus alpha MWP omega. Okay, so you have an estimate of the Heller constant of TF. Okay. The problem of Lipschitz, Lipschitz continuity of uh, TF, continuity, and which is for which Fs, TF is Lipschitz continuous. Again, here we have two cases. Orange case, one is in Moray. Then the following are equivalent. So TF, is Lipschitz continues and the TF from the vanishing to the Moray is Lipschitz and TF from the vanishing to the vanishing is Lipschitz, is equivalent to two, F is Lipschitz as a function from R to R. So this is case one. And then you have case two, is not in Moray. Then you have the equivalence of the following three conditions. So the one, two, three are precisely those before, so I do not rewrite them. So these three should be reported here. And the condition is that F is Lipschitz and F0 is 0. Okay, so finally we have the problem of, so for Uniform action, uniform continuity, alpha Helder continuity, Lipschitz continuity, we have necessary and sufficient conditions. Now, the last problem is the continuity in which we have less information of continuity of TF. Here, unfortunately, we have only, only sufficient conditions and necessary conditions. Although in one case we can also have an necessary and sufficient, but it's quite restricted as you shall see. And these results are basically on the vanishing array. So a necessary condition for continuity. It's only necessary, okay? If TF from the vanishing Moray is continuous. Then F is continuous. And F is subaffine. But we already know it's subaffine because that comes from the action condition. Once it maps this space to the space, automatically it's a subaffine. So the novelty is that it is continuous. If instead, and uh, if, um, again, uh, if period, if, so this was statement one, statement two, if one is not in Moray, Instead, and if 
TF maps the vanishing Mari to Mari. Again, I emphasize that unfortunately we have in the domain the vanishing here only. And uh, no, sorry, no. Uh, if, if you have the 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 the, the, the whole space, that, that's okay because you can take only the action on this small space. Just I made a mistake at this point. Uh, no, it's uh, it would be also okay with the Mari because it's a subcase. Then F is continues, and F is sublinear. So you remember the B is zero. You remember F T less than a constant A times T for all T's. So these are necessary conditions. How about sufficient conditions? So we have only some only something, so sufficient conditions. Assume that the measure of omega it's less than infinity. Uh, by the way, this implies immediately that one is in vanishing more. Okay. And if this constant CF equal to the supremum of Fx minus Fy over one plus X minus Y when X and Y are in R is finite. Then, TF maps more to more and is continuous. And it is kind of curious that such a condition, con sorry, condition is necessary and sufficient. sufficient for the action of TF in some subspaces of BMO. See paper with myself and uh, Boudot and Seeken. So, bold out myself thinking and this is about 20 years ago now okay we did not understand the link between the bmo and the mori in this context but uh, in any case it works okay and we believe that this is not going to be necessary anyway so personal belief but uh, okay and uh, a sufficient condition and and, and now a sufficient condition for um Continuity in generalized vanishing more. In generalized vanishing more. So now, if F is continuous and F is subaffine. Then the TF is continuous from where? From the generalized vanishing more omega intersection with LP. As usual with the maximum of the two norms. P is continuous. Then, so sorry. So here is subaffine. I'm sorry, you can't read it. I wrote it bad, I repeat it, is sub-affine. No, no, sublinear. sorry. It was really wrong. Linear. Then you have this continuity. And in case that uh, if you, if one is in vanishing more, And F continues, and F sub affine now. So it's a more general condition than the sublinearity, of course. Then again, TF 
from the vanishing in omega intersection of p omega to mw0 p omega is continuous. And it is natural to ask whether these conditions can become also um, not only sufficient, but also necessary. And here we have a partial result, a partial result in the sense that it works for a specific type of weights. OK, so this continuity to result in. And uh, so a necessary so, and a sufficient condition under a special assumption. In finishing more spaces. Generalized more. So now I'm going to spell out the condition, which is the this number eta w, which is the infimum of wr. So r greater than zero, of course. So the weight not only it should not touch zero, but it should remain above zero, okay? The infimum should be positive. And the result says that if one is not in the generalized moray, then we have these equivalent conditions, TF, so I'd like to cancel this one, TF, Sorry, uh, if one is, sorry, let's start with this one, then from the vanishing more to the vanishing more. So the result is rather clean, but uh, you have the heavy assumptions is continuous. It's equivalent to MW zero P omega two, the whole vanishing, the whole moray. And the condition is that F is a subfine, is continuous, sorry, and the subfine. You remember that uh, ft is equal to 18 plus b. And necessary and sufficient, you see? Well, what's the hurdle here? Problem is that here it's only the vanishing, and big problem is that you have this heavy condition. For the classical weights, this is satisfied by only one of them. And unfortunately, for the classical weights, is okay, the condition only for W lambda R. Do you remember it was, let me plot it, down to one and then it remains one, okay? Only for this weight here, for the other, for the three classical weights. And if omega is bounded, then the nice thing you remember that R minus lambda omega, it's equal to M W lambda comma one, Omega equal to M W lambda P omega with equivalent norms. So for this space here, in case omega is bounded and you have ni this nice weight, then you have this result which at least covers the bit more. Now I ask the organizers if I still have a moment or other, I can, can also stop here as you wish. Well, well, of course you have um, around five minutes. Please go ahead. Okay, I, I can do a last result and then it's going to be the conclusion. And uh, again, under the assumption that the infimum of the weight is zero, greater than zero, I'm sorry. And uh, one in this case is not in vanishing more. Then the following conditions are equivalent, one, two, three. And here again, you have TF from W0 omega P to MW0 P omega is continuous. 
it's equivalent to Tf from Mw0p omega to Mwp omega continuous, and F is continuous and sublinear. Again, this is, in a sense, at least for the vanishing, a complete result, but the bad thing is that we have to assume this condition here. So, thank you for your attention. Sorry, let me write in red. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. And now we have time for questions, please. Any questions? Hi, just uh, an information. Hello. Okay. Uh, yes. uh, is it an ended work or is a work in progress? Can I have a copy of the, the oh, paper? Okay. So, so we have a finished paper which has been submitted and uh, being evaluated for publication and Professor Karapitians has it. So it is so, a complete uh, paper. I can also, if you wish, I can also make available, let's say, a sort of uh, of uh, of thing which is what I wrote here. Let's say uh, I, I can summarize the results and put them in uh, photo slides. Or Professor Karapitian says a, a, a copy of the paper. So okay, if yes, uh, okay. yes, uh, Massimo, if you agree, we can send a copy of the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, you have the paper. Okay, M maybe we can take out the colors because we put some colors in here and there. But yes, I'll, before I'll that, by tonight, <laughs> no problem. Thanks a lot. Uh, what's your Thank name, you. by the way? Uh, Paola Cavaliere, Università di Salerno, University of Salerno. Ah, yes. Ah, yeah, because uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Softova is there, is working on my Yes. Life. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay. Okay, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Hi, Massimo. Yes. Uh, yes. Hi. So maybe I should uh, speak to this because I... Very I interesting see. lecture. Thank you. Uh, okay, you're uh, Softova, <laughs> I see. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Okay, well, still more questions, please. Maybe I'll have a general comment because, well, Mas Professor Massimo Lanza de Christophis did very nice um, history remarks. And, uh, well, but I would say that the issue that um, we moved from LP to Mori, we thought that it would be kind of generalization of what is done in Apple and the breaker, but then we realized that it, the the study of the separators in these more spaces is quite different from what we know for LP and even Orlich space, because it's a, the norm of more space is very deeply involved. So later we go from the Apple the breaker book to to a more general approach by uh, Bordeaux. Uh, so. Uh, the norm of the Mori makes this study very, very, very difficult in this situation. But Professor Massimo, once the Christophe has already told all this history and remarks very carefully. Well, more questions, please. Well, sometimes people cannot uh, uh, connect with microphones. You can raise your hand if you have questions. Well, if there are no more questions, then let's thank our speaker for a very nice talk. Thank you very much.